All right, let's continue to dive uh, just a little bit deeper into what the firewall is doing for us. Um, remember that when packets come in, we want to throw them away in the simplest way possible. I want to look at this traffic and I want to get rid of everything early because at the early side, it's low resource utilization, it's low intensity. As we start to come in here, we're going to need some more resources. And if you follow all the different vulnerabilities and the security research on firewalls, one of the things that you can potentially do is look at the, sometimes they're described as like signature microengines or protocol dissectors. And the idea of a protocol dissector is it's like, oh, we have an engine inside of the firewall that knows how to decode SIP, that knows how to decode H323, that knows how to decode TFTP, that knows how to decode DNS. Well, these engines could have flaws in them. They could have just weird bugs in the way that they handle certain types of data or what they're expecting to see when they look in a particular location. So maybe they identify a SIP packet based on a port number and they know you know, 100 bytes into that SIP header, uh, they're going to be able to pull out a certain piece of information. Well, if they're expecting, let's say, an orange, and I was to place a coconut or a pineapple there, what would happen? And in some situations, you can crash a firewall with that, which is no good. So by filtering early on, by throwing away IP addresses, or I'm sorry, by, by looking at the source IP, by determining GIP information, and maybe by throwing traffic away that couldn't possibly be legitimate, I can avoid more sophisticated attacks that would have targeted something within my organization or even flaws within protocol inspection on my firewall itself. Pretty scary to think about people compromising a firewall or compromising a switch. But all of this is true, like these things can happen. So the idea is to throw things away as early as possible using the simplest method. Why? Because the advanced inspection methods not only require more resources, but there's more that could go wrong because they're just doing more complicated functions. Maybe they haven't been tested as thoroughly. So this improves performance, like I said, by doing early blocking, or if we're not blocking, we can fast path traffic based on layer three, layer four criteria. Additionally, it provides inspection for encapsulated traffic based on tunnel endpoints. So if traffic comes in, it's GRE, it's IP and IP. Isn't that weird? You can put an IP packet inside of another IP packet. We can put IPv6 and IPv4, we can do Torito tunnels. So we're like, hey, as traffic is coming in, if we detect encapsulation, let's go ahead and decrypt it. Let's decode it. Let's figure out what's happening. Or if we're not going to even accept it, let's toss it as soon as we can. Uh, when we look at the pre-filter policy, it really has three actions available. And these actions are analyze, which means continue doing more analysis, fast path, which just says punt the packet, send it to its next hop, uh, just get it moving immediately, and of course block is going to do a drop. Fast path is what we like to find because we go, hey, this is traffic that doesn't need further analysis, we can move it across the firewall, that keeps our resources lower, that gets this packet right out of the way, makes everything move smoothly. Some of the conditions that we consider are security zones. We look at source and destination IP, we consider the VLAN protocol and port numbers. For tunnel rules, we can also leverage security zones. The tunnel endpoints, referring to like, what office am I connected to? The Phoenix office, the Atlanta office. Uh, again, VLAN information, encapsulation types, and port numbers. We've seen the uh, Lena policy, or the Lena engine, and the way that it controls policies, punts traffic to snort, and so forth. All we're showing you here that's new is specifically where the pre-filter policy lives within this processing chain. Here we can see an example where it's applied. See this, we've got pre-filter. The uh, name of the rule is fast path voice. Our if condition says, hey, when you see traffic from the inside, go into the DMZ, source from this network, the destination port happens to be voice. What do we want to do to that packet? Fast path. It says don't have our voice traffic go through all those additional layers of inspection. It's low latency. I want to make sure it gets delivered right away. 
And once we've got our pre-policy built, our pre-filter policy, we can then apply it within the ACP. The ACP applies to the box as a whole. So this is gonna contain all the rule sets for all the things that we're gonna do. Um, very simple things at layer three, layer four, and then some advanced things within the application layer. So the next generation firewall access control policy actually consists of additional policies and additional rules. Think of it as just a bigger container. Um, as we create those rules, they're gonna define, should we allow the traffic? Should we block the traffic? Should we punt it to IPS? Should we generate logging information? Um, you know, what's going on with SSL decryption? All those rules go into the ACP and then the ACP gets applied to the device. Here they're showing you some of the components of the ACP. At the top, we've got the name. Under pre-filter policy, we can click the link and create a policy or select one that's already built. Notice over here, we've got our SSL policy. Here, we can find our rules. We read these from left to right. Feels very similar to access control lists. Under our actions, here you've got things like allow, but next to it, we can say whether the traffic should be analyzed by IPS, whether we should take a look at the properties of the individual files, whether we wanna do things like logging. Um, all of this ties in within the ACP. So the names and conditions, I think are pretty straightforward. This is referring to rules, which some of you may know as the term, I, I still know this term, ACE, right? So we had an access control list, and in the access control list, the ACL, each line was called an access list entry or ACE, right? So kind of think about it like that. The ACP contains rules. Each rule has basically got a name, it's got conditions, it's got an action. And of course, over on the end, it's got that IPS and file policy uh, inspection settings. That's where we can enable those right here, to, uh, turn on some logging and so forth. So if we wanna add a new rule within the ACP, we can give the rule a name. Then we can give it an action. If we're testing and we wanna try turning it on and off, of course, you've got the enabled tab. Now, once we come in here, we start building our rules. They're like, well, what are you basing this on? Is it based on security zones, like from in to out? Notice that we can just select these zones and then we can add it to source or destination. So we'll see things here and we go, okay, anything coming from that network going to that network. You can also use networks, VLAN tags, users, applications, ports, URLs, and security group tags. When we talk about ports, um, this is like, hey, firewall, when you see HTTP, and when I say HTTP, I mean specifically TCP port 80. Now, if you're doing HTTP on port 8080, my firewall thinks, well, not that, I am just looking at TCP 80. Now, alternatively, instead of saying ports, if I use the word HTTP, the Snort engine is actually smart enough to automatically detect HTTP on non-standard ports. In the old days, we had to configure this using something called PAM, port, uh, port address mappings. I'd create this TCP connection map. Uh, like I'd say, hey, firewall, TCP 8080. And you go, okay, then what? And I'd say, I need you to inspect HTTP. But if you did something dynamic and you changed it to 50-50 just for the heck of it, I couldn't find that. So two different ways to say, hey, firewall, when you see this application. Kind of the classic approach was using port numbers. It's performed in the ASA engine, Lina. It's fast and efficient, but you may incorrectly match traffic for applications on non-native ports, meaning you'll miss it. Using HTTP, we can do protocol inspection across non-standard ports automatically. You go, Hooray, that's easy. Um, the, the downside here is this is gonna be a bit more resource intensive. Uh, your device might be sitting there at 17% utilization. So you could have tons of room to just turn this on and go crazy. Um, but if you're being mindful of your uh, overhead and utilization, uh, just try to keep an eye on it as you enable different features. So here we are looking at the firewalls under the hood and what they do. Um, from the GUI perspective, it's real pretty, right? This is what we see. We've got these rows, we've got icons, we've got colors. We know immediately it's block or deny with 
red and green checkboxes and X's. Uh, below, what we're seeing here is a show access list statement. So we see a named ACL, we see line numbers, we see remarks, which are comments. Um, and again, this should look fairly similar, right? Here we see our hit count. Here we see, and if you're not familiar, every rule in the ASA has a checksum. And then if you ever, the whole config has a checksum, so you can detect that the config has been changed, and then even the lines do. So we can see which line has been altered. Um, Again, show access list just gives us the ability to, to kind of view what's happening within the Lena engine and kind of like a layer three, layer four perspective. And again, here we are just kind of uh, using the more command from the CLI to look at our rule set. And then within the rule set, we can see it being disclosed right here. Pretty neat. And again, here we are just looking at port numbers. So the rules that you come across, let's talk about those real quick. Um, when we define our rules, the rules say, if you see this condition, dot, 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 pause for effect, it's like, okay, then what? Well, we could allow the traffic, and that's gonna send the traffic to the device, but you get further inspection. You can trust it, which goes, oh, go ahead, and it skips further inspection. We can block without sending a TCP reset, so basically just do a silent drop and drop the traffic. Uh, we can do an interactive block, and this is where users have an option to bypass a block, and it applies to HTTP traffic only. So it's like, hey, this is prohibited by your policy. You're not really supposed to be doing this on company time, and they go, that's okay, I wanna continue. We're like, all right. Um, you know, just two different approaches to blocking. And then finally, monitoring. That just says, give me a notification that this event occurred. So here we just see uh, some of the actions that you've got available. Um, you can set a default across the block, uh, and then we can come in with individual rules, and we can take different actions for more specific statements. So when we want to leverage a rule, we want to take further intelligence, right? We said we've got all this Lena stuff we can do, um, but after that we could get in there and really leverage some of the horsepower of the firewall and take a good hard look at this packet. When you decide that you want to do that, um, over here on the right of your rule, there's an inspection tab. And within the inspection tab, you're going to see a drop down where we can select our intrusion policy and another drop down where you can set the file policy. So this allows us to leverage, um, again, a policy which is a collection of tons and tons of parameters, and we're gonna take that policy and apply it to a particular traffic flow. So remember, what's feeding this rule is our if condition, which is over here under like zones, networks, users, applications, ports. If you see something that matches that flow, now we wanna perform the inspection. What inspection? Well, you'll have different options from those dropdowns. So additionally, there's a logging tab, and this is where we can configure logging. You know, even if we allow the transaction, we can still generate a notification. So here we are saying log at the beginning of the connection. We could alternatively and additionally log at the end. And then when we see, see these events, where do we want to send them? The event viewer, you want to also send it to syslog. You want to potentially do SNMP traps. Again, all of these are going to be supported under that logging tab. And once our rules are in place, we can audit them through analysis. If we do analysis, connection events, we're gonna see some details about communication flows through the device. As you can see here, time of the first packet, time of the last packet, the action, the initiator, the responder. Here's the responder's country, ingress zone, egress zone, and so forth. So again, they give us an example of ACP with the use case. They say we want to allow access from the inside network to the DMZ server. We want to allow access uh, from the internet to the DMZ server. We want to block everything else. Uh, but we do want to allow everything from the inside network to the internet except Telnet and non-native ports. Also block social networking sites. Kind of all over the board, right? But wait till you see it inside of ACP. It's pretty straightforward. We've got in to out. So when traffic's coming from the inside to the outside, block Telnet, that's the name of it. Here's my in and out zones. Here's my source, inside, destined, anywhere. 
if the application's telnet, what do we do? Block. Okay, easy, then what? If it's going from inside to outside, and the URL is the category of social media, dump the packet. Now I've got this rule called allow all. Anybody want to guess what that does? Inside to outside, any, any, allow. Now we've got this other rule for different traffic flows. We go, okay, what happens if somebody's from the outside initiating a connection into the DMZ? I go, it depends. What are their ports? If their ports match the ports that's in this destinations ports list, I'm gonna allow. If it's not in the list, implicit deny. How about from the inside of the DMZ? I go, oh sure, if it's from the inside zone to the DMZ zone, and you know, from this network to this network, on these port numbers, allow it. All else, fail. 